Uh, now I'm honored to present Professor uh, Serge Gianisi. Professor G uh, Serge Gianisi uh, is going to talk about evidence-based state of art in uh, graduate elastic stocking. Uh, professor Sergio, uh, he's a professor of, uh, of, uh, in Freire University and US, uh, USH University in Bethesda, United States of uh, America. And he's a founder and uh, president of uh, the Winter uh, Foundation. Uh, also, he has many, many uh, articles uh, and he published more than uh, 60 published and uh, all of them uh, had been uh, cited more than 700 uh, times. Uh, Professor uh, Genesi uh, just published a recent uh, article on uh, sparing, uh, seg uh, segmental sparing of the short supplement vein reflux. Uh, I'm sure that you'll all enjoy his topic today. And uh, please go ahead, Sergio. Dear Lord, thank you so much. And thank you, Ayman, for the nice introduction and Omar for the wonderful uh, job and all the Egyptian friends. I don't know if you notice that I have a little homage over here from Egypt from the last time I was uh, there. It's a present from Wasile. So with, uh, with our bodies, we are separated, of course, in these days, but with our souls, we can still uh, remain together. And I congratulate everybody for this uh, nice initiative of being together. So I will uh, share my screen now. So let me know if uh, it is working for you guys. Can you, yes. see, my can you see my presentation? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. okay, so the topic is, that I've been asked for is uh, compression. Uh, and in particular, like the evidence based state of the art in this. And of course, uh, we will move uh, away from the topic of uh, SWAT, wonderful uh, lecture indeed. But maybe we can also go back to the same topic because indeed post thrombotic syndrome is uh, quite uh, challenging in terms also of compression management. I have uh, no conflicts of interest uh, to declare. The idea is uh, to look at also at the practical point on what we could consider the 10 commandments uh, in compression. So 10 things we could uh, remember every single day we are in our offices. And of course, uh, this is always evidence-based so you can always find the reference of what I am uh, talking about. So over here we are in uh, Europe in terms of uh, guidelines and in the, the second part of the talk, we will have the chance uh, to have a look at uh, um, the other countries also guidelines, because as you remember, and it has been a collective effort for which I really thank uh, uh, many friends that are actually in this uh, also uh, meeting now, uh, that have been part of that. Uh, guidelines are different from uh, uh, area to area. And um, if we look at the one of the European that are like uh, published in 2018, we see that there is quite clear indication with the first two commandments, I say, in patients with the chronic venous disease, but I'd like to point your attention also to the fact that they are mentioning also healthy individuals. Because indeed, compression is focusing always more and more on uh, also occupational, for example, uh, swelling, uh, or also on conditions like uh, prolonged flights that hopefully we will start to have again. And as you can see over here, the indication is quite strong in uh, using uh, compression in uh, these categories with the 1B. At the same time, I'd like to point your attention to this graph that is showing us when we get the best uh, compliance and the best pressure range. So they, they were pointing out over here that if we go over 20 millimeter mercury, we get the risk of losing compliance with our patients. So they were like suggesting this range between 15 and 20. I think this is food for thoughts for us as uh, experts and friends and colleagues in this meeting because uh, other papers like this one of Raju and other that we could quote from the literature are showing that in reality it's a little bit our fault if we lose compliance because indeed up to 63% of cases could be considered not compliant because of uh, wrong prescription from the physicians. We know that indeed it is uh, like prescribing a, a drug so we should be really um, careful in uh, what we prescribe so in terms of dosages or so millimeter of mercury, for example, this is like a typical Italian drug prescription chart. So it's exactly like prescribing a, a drug. And of course, I don't want to annoy you like specifying all the things we should uh, point out to our patients uh, 
when uh, we are prescribing uh, a stocking to be sure that it is effective and that the compliance is maintained. So let's move forward uh, with the evidence. And uh, over here you see Forrest Gump, you might remember the movie. And you remember that he was uh, saying, it was used to say that uh, um, life is like a chocolate box. You never know what you're gonna get. And that's a little bit in my vision, uh, the evolution of chronic venous disease. And indeed we should not say that compression can uh, stop the evolution of chronic venous disease. Even if we have some preliminary evidence that could suggest it. For example, this paper from Costas was uh, showing that in patients who were operated on both legs and then uh, using uh, one uh, um, uh, stocking on one leg and not in the other, well, there was like easier recurrence in uh, the legs uh, that were uh, not using compression. So for sure, this will be a topic of future research. I'm happy to uh, have with us huge giants uh, like uh, Professor Kabnik, uh, with whom we could discuss about the meaning of uh, requesting uh, uh, several weeks of compression in the USA uh, from the insurances before um, allowing the coverage of a procedure. So as uh, you might all know, uh, in US, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Lowell, they are uh, requesting uh, sometimes under compression to see if you really need this procedure. And the interesting thing is that if you fly on the other side of the Atlantic and you land in UK, they're actually recommending against the use of compression stockings to treat chronic venous disease if you can do a procedure. But they are also saying that if you cannot have a procedure, well, in that case, stockings could be useful. And we could discuss about this, but the way I look at that is actually suggesting that compression stockings indeed can be effective. So moving forward with our commandments, we see that it has uh, been uh, reported uh, that uh, there could be an improvement of skin changes in patients uh, with chronic venous disease using compression. Of course, you see always uh, the grade of evidence is uh, not uh, so high. And the reason uh, for which we have this uh, C is that as it has been reported in the literature, it is quite difficult, of course, to have a randomized comparative trial comparing compression versus no compression in patients with the severe stages. Because uh, empirically also we know the importance of compression and we know the importance of compression in uh, the advanced stages like uh, ulceration. These are uh, nice uh, papers, for example, uh, showing that in specific for lipodermatosclerosis, you see the grade is going a little bit higher because it has been demonstrated that there is an improvement in uh, the group that is using stockings in uh, uh, the control and uh, resolution eventually of lipodermatosclerosis. You are all listening to me right, guys. Just a little check. Can you hear me nicely? Uh, or am I alone over here? I all is good? I can hear you well, perfect. Yes. Okay, just a little check. So moving, uh, moving forward, um, uh, we go to the highest grade of evidence, uh, 1A. And as we know, uh, it has been highly demonstrated that in terms of recurrence, compression is really needed. Just uh, I'd like to point out uh, some interesting data, for example, from this paper that is uh, showing uh, with the randomization of uh, uh, multiple studies in reality, that uh, even if you use gravitic compression stockings against the bandage, you can have a significant improvement in the healing rate and even a shorter time. We could discuss over here about the bias in bandaging of not knowing how much pressure is really put into that bandage because as we know, many studies unfortunately are not reporting the interface pressure. But that's a topic for further discussion, I say. As you can see, fourth commandment, grade 1A, answer healing and pain. So of course, in these advanced stages, we know the value of compression. And this is, uh, I think, a, a nice uh, um, chart showing, uh, and I, I actually use it also with my patients, to show how a compliant patient to compression has a significant uh, um, decrease in the risk of having the recurrences after an ulceration, up to nine times. So I think we should really stick this into our mind and into our patient's mind. Now, trying to wake everybody up a little bit, Angelina Jolie over here is reminding us of the importance of compression also in the post-procedural phase, for example, in this specific indication for aesthetic treatment. In terms of liquid sclerotherapy, as you can see, it has been recommended with a grade 2B. Again, of course, mild indication, but it is reported that three weeks of 23 to 30 millimeter mercury can improve the aesthetic result. 
it has been uh, uh, reported indeed uh, in uh, the guidelines in uh, Europe that uh, it is recommended to use a compression after GSV treatment to reduce postoperative uh, side effects. Now we could get into a very uh, big discussion on this topic because if we really dissect uh, the literature, there are like a different uh, point of analysis that uh, we could have. But I said that the take home message is that we have indeed in Europe a recommendation 1B of using uh, compression uh, after surgery, after sclerotherapy, as we have seen before. But we have also uh, contradicting literature, for example, like this one showing uh, that after foam sclerotherapy, uh, 15 20 millimeter of mercury versus no compression was really not making uh, any significant difference. And on this, I would comment that maybe the pressure level should be always checked twice uh, because uh, if we consider, for example, foam sclerotherapy at the thigh with uh, such a low pressure level, of course, we know that according to the Laplace law, we will have a very low level of pressure at the thigh. So it would be like comparing uh, no compression with no compression. So if I compare nothing with nothing, basically, of course, I see no difference. And then i like to point out uh, that it was uh, reported, for example, with uh, thromboembolic deterrence that one week and three weeks were really not making any significant difference. But also in this case, we should point out that, of course, we have two effects in compression. One that is uh, the one of edema control, for which, as we know, we don't need that much pressure. If we think about the socks that tonight are leaving a dent on our legs, like the not compressive stockings, just a simple socks, we know that that small amount of pressure is able to act on the edema. But on the other side, we have to act on the hemodynamic aspects. And for the hemodynamic aspects, of course, we need higher pressure levels. So we should bring some together uh, about the use or not of post-procedural compression. And I will say that in my opinion, despite uh, the recommendations, we are still failing in really giving an answer to that. Because if we really dissect the literature, there is an evidence that is not so strong, even if we know that empirically it's a, a strong evidence. On the other side, we could look at the literature in another way, saying uh, that of course, not all patients return to a symptomatic uh, seizure. And then, of course, if we had a patient with an answer, there, there is the risk of ulceration. And I'd like to take you back to the concept that we had at the beginning for which whoever is at risk of developing Venus-like symptoms or signs receive a recommendation of 1B. So again, there are different ways of looking at that, but I think that compression in all these situations can help. Now let's go back to the thrombosis topic. And so after deep venous thrombosis in Europe, it is recommended to use immediate compression with a grade 1B to reduce pain and swelling. I think that the word immediate is really important. There is a, a nice paper that is showing uh, the effect of the central uh, um, memory of the pain of the uh, central nervous system for which if we experience pain, or like a pain-like symptom, we are going to have a sort of memory of that. So for example, in the SOX trial, the delay of using a stocking could have biased the perception of pain in these patients. So it's really important, also according to the literature, to start with compression as soon as possible. Uh, back in the days, it has been demonstrated that it can even improve the walking distance of our patients uh, who experience uh, DVT and, of course, improve the quality of life. Uh, there is um, evidence that it uh, can uh, reduce the thrombus uh, growth. You see, again, the grade uh, 1B. And if we talk about the superficial venous thrombosis, unfortunately, we should uh, work a little bit more in science uh, in this aspect because uh, we see that we are uh, missing uh, uh, very well-designed uh, uh, studies with a grade 1C, even if uh, I think uh, uh, no one of us uh, would avoid to put a compression stocking uh, if there are no contraindications in uh, a patient with the superficial venous thrombosis. Now, the prevention of post-thrombotic syndrome would really require other two hours of uh, talk, and uh, of course, this is not uh, the case. Let's say that, uh, again, in Europe, we have an indication to use uh, um, compression with a grade uh, one uh, B. And again, of course, we could uh, open uh, the Pandora base uh, of um, uh, the SOX trial, and uh, we all uh, are familiar with that, and we are all familiar uh, also with the criticism that uh, has uh, been brought after that. We know about the poor compliance evaluation, uh, the difference in patients' characteristics, 
the use of different anticoagulants, the use of placebo stockings that could have actually been effective in that, as we were saying before, remember the dent that remains uh, tonight on our ankles if you are using, for example, the socks. And then the delay in the application of uh, the compression, that is exactly what I was saying to you before in terms of uh, the central memory of uh, the pain. Post-thrombotic syndrome treatment, uh, uh, nine uh, golden rule. Also in this case, there is uh, an indication of uh, 1B with uh, some uh, previous uh, data showing uh, like in this paper by Latimer, an improvement in uh, the hemodynamics parameters in these uh, patients under um, compression. And then we get to the big uh, one, uh, which is uh, the last one, of course, of the lymphedema. Also in this case, like in the answer, it has been demonstrated that uh, in the maintenance of uh, lymphedema, of course, proper compression is uh, highly graded with a 1A, uh, with a pressures that are changing based on the guidelines and on the investigations, but of course are quite high. But I'd like also to make a comment, to be honest, because we have a big uh, bias, in my opinion, in these investigations on the fact that uh, in reality, I'm not familiar with uh, any paper that is uh, looking just at compression. These are patients that are, of course, ethically always doing uh, some uh, manual drainage or some other a treatment part of uh, uh, the CDP treatment of, uh, of lymphedema, for which we should really try to design properly, also in this case, a study to be sure that we are giving the proper light to compression, as we all know, indeed, also empirically, uh, it works. And with this, I could say that I'm done, but in reality, I am not, because uh, with compression, we could go on and on and on. So uh, moving toward uh, the first uh, part end of this talk, uh, I would just like to brainstorm with you about the indications we have in compression in terms uh, of um, uh, postoperative uh, care of our patients. As we know, we have to give uh, a score to our procedure and we have to give a score to our patient. And we know that sometimes we can find ourselves in the difficult situations of having patients that are at risk of uh, uh, developing a hemorrhage at the same time of uh, developing also a DVT. And for this reason, we should always remember that in these high risk cases, we could uh, rely just uh, on proper uh, compression, combining, of course, intermittent traumatic compression and graduated compression in the proper way. But I'd like also to point out to you a nice uh, paper that eventually, if we'll have time, uh, we'll discuss later on, that was showing that just in 19% of patients in the trauma unit, intermittent traumatic compression was used properly. So again, we should always be sure that we have homogeneous data when we are analyzing them, because for example, those data could have been biased by the fact that intermittent traumatic compression was not used properly. The take home message for our everyday practice that I'm sure we are all familiar with is that we can rely on graduated compression stockings and intermittent traumatic compression if we are at high risk of bleeding so that anticoagulation is temporarily contraindicated. Hopefully soon uh, we will all um, start uh, flying again. And uh, that's the most common question, the one if we should use or not uh, um, graduated compression stockings. Well, we all know uh, the biases that have been reported in the different investigations uh, related to flight and thrombosis and uh, venous symptoms. The indication currently in Europe is to be for long distance traveling, but I'd like to know what in Europe we mean by long distance traveling, because it has never been really uh, defined. And of course, in these cases, in patients at high risk, uh, uh, we could even think about a combination of anticoagulants and uh, compression with a grade 2C. Some papers that I think are worthy to be uh, remembered are the ones that are showing, for example, that after five hours with uh, uh, mild compression, we have better comfort and uh, swelling. Uh, also, this one, I think, um, was uh, interesting, uh, showing uh, that uh, the ones who were wearing compression experience no thrombosis, while uh, the other ones uh, uh, without stockings actually experience uh, thrombosis. But again, this is another field uh, that is pretty interesting, in my opinion, in terms of research. And indeed, we recently published a paper uh, that is quite unique. I mean, it's a very simple paper, but it was always the same subject. And it has never uh, been done always on the same subject, up to my knowledge. So the bias is that, for example, in some investigations, they were um, uh, putting the stockings while they were on the ground transportation to the airport. In other investigations, they were putting the stockings where they were on the plane. So there were like different uh, situations that could change the game. 
Of course, uh, it happens to us uh, uh, pretty frequently to be asked about the pregnancy and compression. But also there, we should really work a little bit more. And uh, also for this reason, we are developing with the Living Foundation projects with the OBGYN that also for pelvic venous disorder, of course, require um, bigger collaboration uh, between the two different specialties of ours and OBGYN itself. We know that compression improves the venous drainage, heaviness and tiredness and pain in these patients actually not patients, uh, subjects that are experiencing uh, pregnancy. But we should uh, be honest with them and of course uh, stating that we have not uh, solid data demonstrating, again, as I said before, uh, with Forrest Gump uh, uh, metaphor, that we can prevent the varicose veins evolution. For sure, we can say that they improve uh, symptoms. They're like papers that are contradicting because some are showing that they could control edema, other are showing uh, not. Uh, we know empirically they do in reality. The big topic, uh, of course, of uh, patients with arterial disease, well, we know the traffic light uh, that, um, uh, according to the different uh, indications, but uh, over 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 of um, um, ankle brachial index, uh, uh, of course, with proper care, uh, we should not worry too much about uh, the use of proper compression. When we are ranging uh, uh, between 0 0.55 and uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, uh, yellow light, so we have to be really cautious. They're like a paper just recently published uh, that uh, uh, are showing uh, that even 30, 40 millimeter mercury were not really changing the game in terms of arterial, um, in the reality actually improving the arterial uh, flow. Uh, below 0 0.55, of course, we can not do that. Uh, I rem remember a very nice uh, sentence of, of the master of compression, Professor Patch, who is uh, used to say that sometimes a contraindication is a good indication. I will repeat, sometimes a contraindication is actually a good indication. So, for example, in all the cases you see here on the left, even if there is uh, some minor arterial impairment, uh, um, com a good compression is actually indicated, absolutely. Of course, it will not be indicated in case we are experiencing uh, peripheral neuropathy. We all know why it is uh, contraindicated in these cases, traffic alter uh, alteration, severe heart failure. I was pretty impressed by this paper recently published showing that if it is uh, um, uh, an heart uh, failure that is uh, stable, still you could use compression. So I think also in that topic we will have to to dig a little bit more in the literature. And uh, of course, if you have severe lower limb asymmetry, we know that uh, in reality, uh, there are like multiple options also of custom made compression for which we could uh, rely on compression also in these cases, diabetes, of course, and we said before, the ABI. So looking at uh, where compression is uh, going in the future, and since we have looked at the present actions, so we have uh, demonstrated uh, so far that uh, compression is able indeed uh, to counteract venous hypertension, to increase the calf pump performance, to promote venous and lymphatic return. It has an action uh, also at the microcirculatory level and improving also leg oxygenation in particular in uh, arterial patients. I, I find it pretty uh, helpful in many cases. Uh, and also it is uh, um, demonstrated in a very preliminary way, I have to say. We still have to work a lot, I think, on the inflammatory cytokines because it is really easy to get uh, biases in, uh, in that topic. All these things, I would say, uh, been pretty much uh, uh, solid and demonstrated. What we should uh, really work in the future, I think, is starting from ground zero. So, for example, when we are looking at uh, the television, uh, what we will be looking tonight at the television, we will see some commercial like these ones with uh, certified elastic stocking wannabes. I think that uh, we as experts and as societies, we should really advocate for, uh, for our patients uh, indeed and for certified products, uh, because if not, we really get the risk uh, of confounding uh, the population. This is a real commercial, for example. They are like uh, claiming that these stockings are eating performance and improving uh, blood circulation. And I would like to ask you what you think they mean, uh, the commercial guys here, when they are writing improving blood circulation. At the same time, we should be able in the near future to answer to a very simple question. I'd like to ask you what you are saying to your patients when they are saying, uh, doctor, should I go walking? And of course, we usually say yes, but uh, for how long? Where is the demonstration that they have to walk uh, for um, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, one hour? And uh, what should we tell them? Should they use or not compression uh, if they are anti-subjects or if they are like a chronic venous disease patient? 
and uh, which uh, uh, compression level we should recommend them eventually if uh, we decide to give them in case they are, for example, healthy subjects. To answer to these questions, uh, we placed uh, some studies that are published, some of them on JVS, some on Phlebology Journal. Uh, so all the data are there if you want uh, to dive into the literature on healthy subjects to really start from ground zero and understand how it goes. And this is the chance to deeply thank um, Dr. Erika Menegatti that is always involved with these investigations with the sport and, uh, and medicine. So you see, we put people on treadmills because the first problem is always having uh, standardized the data. Uh, so we standardized the velocity because as you can see, these uh, two nice uh, um, friends of ours on the treadmill are going to two different velocities that are at the same time with the same uh, metabolic impact so that we kind of homogeneous the data. Basically, the same people experience the walking uh, with and without uh, stockings for 30 minutes at a standardized pace, uh, standardized uh, velocity. The stockings were like 20, 30. And what we demonstrated is that after 30 minutes in an empty subject of walking without stockings, you have no variations in volume while 20, 30 millimeter mercury are able uh, to diminish uh, by 5% of this uh, volume. Now, the interesting thing was uh, that in the group uh, wearing stockings, there was a significant uh, decrease in the perceived exertion that was uh, measured with a standardized uh, scale that is called the Borg's scale that is ranging from 6 to 20, where 6 is no effort and 20 is the effort you have when you are going running with Professor Luis Leon that is a, a marathon uh, um, friend of ours. So as you can see in the group that was using stocking, the score was significantly lower. So showing that even in empty subjects, uh, after 30 minutes, there is an impact on the perceived exertion for which the take home message I say is if you want really to facilitate your subjects to go walking, uh, and of course you can help him with the proper compression. But then this subject could ask you if uh, uh, they can go with a dog. So can they stop and go like when you are walking with your dog, which is exactly the situation you have when uh, you are walking downtown and you're stopping, for example, in front of a shop and you're restarting again. Because in our everyday clinical practice, our patients could ask us if they have to go walking continuously or if uh, uh, they can walk intermittently. Now, what do we really know about uh, intermittent versus uh, continuous uh, walking? There is, uh, in reality, up to my knowledge, uh, no literature on uh, this. And for this reason, we placed a second study. I'd just like to be sure I'm not on my own. <laughs> are, are there still our friends over here? Are you, yes. Are you yes. Okay, that is great. Sorry, guys, just checking out. Yes, yeah, it's fantastic. So with this second investigation, we went to the golf course. Uh, the golf course because uh, we really wanted to simulate the intermittent walking because if you think about that, when uh, you play golf, you walk toward the golf ball and then uh, you stop, you have your shot and then uh, you uh, walk again. And it was really a an, uh, an passion of golf and it was a thinking that walking on the golf course was perfectly good for our leg because we are activating the calf fan. But I questioned myself about uh, what was going to happen for real in terms of lower limb volume and perceived exertion uh, using different kind of compression. So what we did was um, a placebo um, investigation where people didn't know what kind of compression they were wearing on. Of course, the stockings were all the same. It has been quite a serious investigation done also with the sport institutions you see over here. And uh, we randomized basically sham 18 and 23. The interesting part of the 23 was that one group had also uh, the foot cover and another group at the sleeve because uh, your patients could also ask you, doctor, should I use uh, the sleeve in the same way I use graduated compression stockings or like is, is it different? Now we know that a uh, whole one, we are significantly different from all 18 in terms of perceived uh, exertion. So we did the Borg's scale also in uh, these patients to see how they were feeling uh, at the end of the 18 nose. Now, if you look at the data, you can see that, uh, and I was pretty impressed by this. If you say to your subjects, the anti subjects, to go walking uh, for the 18 ohms without stockings, basically, or with the sham, basically, in this case, you have an increase of the lower limb volume. It's not like really draining. And the answer is that very probably you are like spending more time standing up. So it's uh, like a pump. If you don't uh, charge the pump, of course, you have uh, more venous dilation or like at uh, least uh, venous uh, pooling. With 18 millimeter of mercury, it was uh, possible to uh, have no significant variation in the lower limb volume. At 23 millimeter of mercury, both with uh, and without the foot cover, 
the lower limb volume was decreasing by 4%. Now, this is interesting because they were again blinded and uh, only the group who had 23 millimeter mercury had a significant decrease in the Borg's scale, independently by the fact that they were using or not uh, the foot coverage of uh, the stocking. Of course, there is the bias of having uh, compared in this case two different scenarios, the continuous and the intermittent walking in these two investigations. But in both cases, we demonstrated that a certain amount of pressure was necessary to have uh, an impact on uh, the perceived exertion. And I think this is important to start thinking, of course, these are preliminary data, but it's uh, truly our moral duty to advocate for certified products and to advocate for our uh, anti-subjects and patients who are asking us what kind of compression they should use, for example, in their sport or everyday practice. But maybe they are not sport guys. Thank you, Sergio. Yes? <clears throat> it is very, very, very interesting talk. And uh, I have a lot of questions. Can we get a break to answer some questions? Then yeah. continue. So, so I can also drink. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tell me. Okay. Uh, first question. Uh, my colleague is asking a question, and he wants comment from uh, doctor uh, from you, then from Mark Whitley, and uh, from uh, uh, Victor Canetta. He well, is asking. Uh, he is asking about uh, your proposal that there is no routine use of elastic stocking after the procedure. No, maybe it was misunderstood. I didn't say that there is no routine use of, uh, of the stocking use after the procedure. Actually, I, I'm on the opposite side. Even after a glue procedure, I usually use the stocking because I consider stocking an anti-inflammatory drug more than a physical agent because of what we are seeing, for example, in preliminary data on, uh, on the cytokines level. So maybe I didn't understand properly the question, but if the question is uh, uh, if there is no routine use of compression, to the contrary, let's say that there is uh, absolutely uh, a routine use of compression, I would suggest it even empirically if uh, we don't have very strong data in this moment uh, on uh, the evidence-based part. Now, what we are missing, in my opinion, is a solid data collection on this. For which, if you look also at the documents that have been recently published from AVF, SVS, AVLS, um, it has been left basically to the health professional to decide what kind of compression we should use. But maybe it was better to answer after Mark and Victor, there are two big experts as well. So let's see what they say. Okay, can we get a comment from uh, Dr. Mark? Uh, Mark Whitley is not with us, but we have uh, Professor Victor Canata uh, with us. Thanks, everybody, and thanks to this giant meeting. We have more already than 100, and the program is already collapsed, Sergio. <laughs> uh, there are people outside asking to how can they go in, and they are impossible to hook in. Uh, we will improve for the next time. Okay, thanks to everybody, meaning that we are working, or, or the work of Ayman and Omar is succeeding very, very nice so, so far. Okay. My point is like this. Uh, I, I think I, I think the same that you, Sergio. I think everybody else should get uh, stockings. But the problem is, um, <coughs> I, I would like just to ask to Lowell and everybody that do, they are doing uh, procedures at the same time. How do they deal? If I do a a a, a Elvis procedure with uh, phlebectomies, my trouble is always when I I have my nurses who put everything to the patient and put every all the, the compressions. But the point is what will be it at the end and how much compression should apply to, to have a better view of what's going on. I usually apply at 15 to 20 and then if uh, the patient feel that they feeling fine and go higher. What are to everybody else uh, the, the first uh, compression that should apply after a procedure is my ask, my question. Okay. What about Professor Kabnik? Do you like to add your comment? Yes. Uh, in the United States, it's very variable after a thermal ablation. There's not been any real good studies to show that it's certainly effective in terms of increasing the efficacy. What's been shown is that it may reduce the pain score uh, if you look at a visual analog score, it may reduce it one point. So a lot of us are tending and shying away from compression post-thermal. 
if we're doing phlebectomy at the same time, then that's a different story. I think we, we certainly would use compression and we would probably use compression for at least seven days, 20 to 30. And the reason for it is whether it makes the patient feel better or not, we don't want them looking at their leg all the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is also a very nice question uh, to you, Sergio. Uh, the question come from Hinder Bedi. Hinder Bedi, I think from India. He, yes. said, he said his question is how to modify compression in post robotic syndrome with associated arterial disease, peripheral arterial disease. Can we modify as per APVI or totally avoid it? No, no, absolutely the first one in my opinion. So again, it has been shown uh, also with intermittent pneumatic compression last year. And there are also um, new devices that are combining the possibility of having both a constant pressure and an intermittent pneumatic compression always in the same, let's say, booth. So it has to be absolutely customized, uh, I would say in my opinion, but also according to the preliminary evidences we have. And this also in terms of intermittent pneumatic compression, uh, because it has been demonstrated that it is able to increase uh, the oxygenation, very probably because it is uh, improving uh, uh, the, the afterload, the resistance that they are encountering with the venous flow. So absolutely to be customized and used. Okay. And uh, it, it's a chance to say hi to my safe friend because I know uh, the person who, who made oh, the question. Okay. Uh, do you like to add your comment to Professor Kavnik and Professor Victor? Oh, well, yes. After you. Okay. Go ahead, Victor. I'll follow. Oh, so, so okay, I would, if I can, I would just point out a very nice question of uh, Rashad uh, Bishara, <laughs> a, a great uh, uh, expert from Egypt, indeed, that is asking if we should recommend compression for post thrombotic patients who are asymptomatic. Well, uh, if it is uh, like, particularly in the early stages, it has been demonstrated that proper compression applied uh, in the immediate uh, phase is able to reduce by 20% also the uh, residual obstruction inside uh, the deep vessel that is translated in a reduction of 8% of the possible evolution of PTS. So in this case, I, I think it is pretty interesting to say yes. Okay. Uh, usually, uh, sorry to my, uh, okay. You are listening, my uh, yes, answer yes. the question? Okay, yeah. fine. Uh, I think the problem is like this in like uh, we are in, in Egypt is a hot country to like me, like my country, and how we will be able to get those patients to follow through the 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 stockings, how how they will be able to in, to go with the compression for more than one, two, three, or four months. But the trouble is uh, usually succeed when you show the patient that they will improve, that will be do better after the compression, and we have to teach them, and we keep doing it, and give guidelines and show them what is the best, okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, Professor Kavnik? I just, uh, from, from a point of Sergio, I certainly agree with him. For those people that have arterial insufficiency, there is a, a standard in terms of, of compression hose. There is some talk about a, an absolute number, which I'm not sure I agree with, uh, in terms of, of 0.6 or an ABI. But I think that we need to be cognizant of the fact that it is supportive of compression. Okay, excellent. We have another question from Professor Wasila Taha. He, she's one of the most eminent uh, angiologists in Egypt. She's the one who gave me this, actually. Yes, he said, uh, great presentation, dear Sergio. Uh, in post-thrombotic syndrome, when you start to recommend your patient to put compression stocking just immediate or whenever, or he or she start symptoms. Thank I you say, for your presentation. I would say that uh, I prescribed that the day before they have the thrombus, and meaning <laughs> that uh, I... I That's right. As, as, I, as I said before, there is also a central memory of pain that is a very interesting concept, I think, for which if you experience pain, then uh, you will be more sensitive to pain. And also this will uh, uh, basically uh, bias the old investigation that we had on post-traumatic syndrome in terms of uh, symptoms. So the answer is absolutely 
immediate compression as it has been demonstrated. Now, the real question would be when we stop it, because uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the last part of the talk, if we will have time, we will go through the guidelines uh, from all around the world with uh, the winter document we published uh, together with uh, all our friends last year. Uh, but um, not everybody agrees in terms of guidelines, uh, but it's no more valid, in my opinion, the two years concept of compression. Uh, it has been published with the EDEL study that, of course, we could st stay around six months and then individualize the treatment. So the, the interesting part would be understanding when we should stop it eventually, okay. if we should, if we should. Okay, we, we have more than 110 uh, attendees and we have around 200 over the Facebook. So you have 300 vascular surgeons mm. already joined in since uh, the do, do my look? Do my hair look fine? <laughs> yes, you look okay. fantastic. And okay. all best wishes to United States, uh, uh, famous surgeon in Italy. I'm, I'm sure you will become successful out of this war. If anyone have a question, he likes to say the question in his own voice. You can have the command of raising your hand and then we'll give you access to say your question with your voice. So excellent. We have now one raise his hand, Syrian Narian. And uh, if we can give him the access to speak, now you have your mic on uh, Syrian, please. I hope he's not asking me what was the score of my last squash competition with him. <laughs> because that would no, be really humiliating in front of 300 people. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, Sergio, I'm glad you can hear me. It's lovely to see you. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on Professor Wool's recent research that showed that at about 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury compression, the cephalus vein is open, but the popliteal veins are closed. Um, so this odd paradoxical finding, how would you, uh, you know, explain that with compression stockings as you've described them? Wonderful question, Ram, and I would say that it is not a paradox. It's a phenomenal investigation of our friend uh, Jean-Francois Houl, and uh, there also is uh, following uh, the investigations of Parsh and Mossi. But uh, it's not paradox, uh, because if you think about a sponge, like if it is, it is the subcutaneous tissue, if you are like pushing on a sponge, uh, the GSV and in particular the tributaries are going to fall inside the subcutaneous tissue. While it is uh, uh, the fascia effect that is compressing, of course, the vessel in inside uh, the muscle compartment for which we see in MRI investigation that we have this phenomenon. And indeed, this offers us the chance to dive into the physiopathology of compression, which is not like simply, in my opinion, compression of the big vessels. It's uh, mainly, uh, in, uh, in the microcircular level uh, at the end, in my opinion. And this could uh, uh, find an explanation also in the data we see with intermittent pneumatic compression improving the oxygenation. Thanks, Sergio. Excellent. Uh, I would like to welcome Professor Atif Salam, one of the most eminent professors from United States. He uh, has joining us and uh, he will be uh, having presentation soon. So let me take another question and then we'll continue your fascinating lecture. We have a question from Dr. Muhammad Mansouri. He said, regarding compression pressure, you mentioned in the first slide, 15 to 20 millimeter mercury is typical. But later, you all recommend compression from 23 to 30 millimeter mercury, uh, and in lymphedema, 30 to 40. Does, does it decrease the curve? Of compliance, you mean? The, the curve yeah. of compliance? Yeah. Yes. It's compliant. Well, these are, of course, uh, this is a salad of um, um, investigations, the one I propose to you to uh, fuel brainstorming as it is nicely happening. So what I was saying in the first slide is that according to that investigation, they were recommending to stay around 15, 20 when you are like in mild chronic renal disease cases, because uh, over that you get uh, a loss of compliance. But immediately in the following slide, I quoted the Raju that published that uh, more than 60% of cases of lack of compliance are associated uh, with the wrong prescription. It's like wearing a jacket that is too tight for which you don't like to wear it. But uh, in reality, if you prescribe a proper uh, compression, it has been demonstrated also with an investigation of a uh, few months ago, uh, that uh, it is basically the wrong prescription, not the, the, the stocking per se, lowering down the compliance. And indeed, it has been demonstrated with multiple studies that education of the patients and of the physicians leads to increasing compliance. So what I was saying with the 2030 
was not like that I was recommending that kind of pressure, but I was saying that in a healthy subjects to whom to who you want, uh, to whom, in, who, in which in whom you want to have an improvement, for example, in terms of the performance, what we notice with this preliminary investigation is that you need a little bit more pressure. That in my way of looking at that makes sense because uh, it is acting more on the hemodynamic aspects of compression. That it requires a little bit more, not even compression very probably in terms of pressure, but stiffness. On the other side, um, if you want to control edema, you can stay on lower levels. Now, the one of lymphedema, of course, uh, it is uh, interesting as a concept, but there we are talking about a sponge that is full of fluid for which uh, um, a higher compression is usually required, but it has also dem been demonstrated uh, by most in part in 2015 that, for example, if you look at the investigation with the circade, uh, with adjustable compression wraps, you have less pressure, but still uh, the same results are even better. Excellent. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it very much. So we'll continue the second part of your lecture. I really like this platform because we have really good hour for one hour presentation, not the Congress eight or 10 minutes. And we have really good time for discussion. So please continue, Sergio. Okay, we try to rush up a little bit then on this topic. This one was another publication on journal vascular surgery where we look at what happened in terms of occupational, for example, edema. So uh, the interesting part of this investigation was having always the same subject, uh, sitting 30 minutes, standing 30 minutes, walking in a standardized way for 30 minutes, and then doing the same with the stockings. Now, we look at the lower limb volume, but, and we added also the bioimpedance evaluation that is pretty interesting as a data. And we also look at the lower limb shape impact on uh, uh, compression. That is a thing that we usually don't consider. Somebody could have, for example, a nice uh, uh, Prosecco bottle shape of leg. Somebody else could have a nice uh, tequila bottle shape, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, would have some differences in terms of uh, the final pressure. We are talking about healthy subjects. We are talking about uh, uh, young subjects also, as you can see from the age, because indeed maybe you're familiar with the movie The Ring, uh, where it was, uh, they were used to say in seven days something horrible will happen to you. And uh, indeed it is a little bit of a joke to say that uh, only a resident would have been so patient and nice to come every seven days to stay 30 minutes of sitting, standing and uh, walking with and without stockings. The pressure here, as you can see, is lower. It's a 16, 20 millimeter mercury. Uh, when they were walking, we used uh, the Tanaka's uh, formula, that is the formula I was mentioning before, to standardize the, the face on the treadmill. And this is a suggestion for you. It's really easy, as you can see, to calculate. And it allows you to have always the same homogeneous data in terms of uh, walking. Uh, because if not, uh, if I go walking, for example, with Professor Luis Leon, or if I go playing squash with the Professor Sram Rayan, I will have a totally different uh, impact in terms of metabolism. The lower limb volume was uh, calculated with the Kunke's formula, so the truncated cone formula, and this allowed us uh, to have uh, the circumference of the leg every four centimeters, so that we could uh, reconstruct also the shape in this way of uh, the limb. An important thing we usually don't do is uh, to measure always the interface pressure to be sure about uh, the pressure we have over there. And then, uh, as you can see, what happens is that when uh, you're looking at the volumes of uh, people uh, um, walking, uh, standing, and sitting without graduated compression stockings, what happens is that when they're walking at 30 minutes, no significant difference it is in accordance also with the data we had before. When they are standing up for 30 minutes, empty subjects, young subjects have already an increase of the volume that is uh, pretty significant. There is no significant variation when they are sitting for 30 minutes, slightly increased. When they are using stockings, to the contrary, there is always uh, a decrease in uh, uh, the lower limb volume. And this is interesting, but I wouldn't say that this is the big information. Now, the big data is in the bioimpedance, so the amount of extracellular versus intracellular fluid. As you can see, the liquids were really shifting according to the bioimpedance only where they were walking with stockings. So the only moment in which you have a real significant pump effect, according to the, this bioimpedance data, is when they are walking with stockings. So we could discuss later on about this data a little bit more. The other interesting data is this one. If we look at the interface pressure in B that we know is the angle and in B1 that we know is uh, just below the cap basically, we see that the pressure level are uh, more or less the ones declared uh, by the industry. 
But if we look at the single cases, we see that there is a significant variation for which in uh, up to 30% of cases, you could have uh, not a graduated, but rather a progressive compression. So more pressure in the cuff rather than in the ankle based on the shape. And this, for example, happens in my leg, uh, where you have, for example, uh, a little bit more pressure in the cuff rather than in the ankle. But in the end, this is uh, not affecting uh, the anti-edema effect. And it could actually even improve the pump effect as for some investigation always by Hugo Parch that was showing that in this condition, you could even increase the pump. Let's say that uh, in this preliminary data, if we take out uh, two outliers, basically there was a, a negative linear correlation between the pressure values and the circumferences, which is, to make it simple, translating the fact that we all have our own kind of um, bottle in terms of um, um, lower limb, that uh, stockings, when prescribed properly, exert the right pressure, but it is important that we take the measures not just of the ankle, but also of the calf, and we go back to the same concept we were saying before, it's like a jacket for, for, for which you uh, have to have the proper measurement, if not uh, the results won't be like so satisfying. And then let's move forward. I think we have still uh, 11 minutes, right? So if we look, can I go forward? Hello? Yes, yes, you yes. can continue. Okay. Yes, you have 10 minutes left, yes. And, and and this gives us the idea even more that in the near future, we will have to look at compression more on uh, the um, biological part in the biochemistry of, uh, of the compression even more than the physics. And this would be a little bit of a um, strong comment on how we do the investigations on uh, the biochemical part of compression because the models we usually use are just standing up, for example, still. And uh, we use, uh, for example, blood, while maybe we should use a urine because the metabolites are faster moved over there rather than on the other path. For this, we are literally on our knees, as you can see, collecting uh, blood and not only. So uh, I hope that uh, soon we will be able to give you more answer on this. Uh, now we are like under a ministry of health in Italy grant, so uh, there is a data embargo, and I hope uh, soon we will be able to give you more insights. Uh, in the future of compression, the way I look at that is, uh, for example, with the nice experience we had, and this is again a chance to thank all the friends who have been uh, there uh, the last the winter meeting, a collaboration uh, with um, uh, the World Ski um, Cup uh, that was there, and that was the reason why we went there, because we started studying compression in the different sports. And it is very interesting to see that we cannot really say compression works or doesn't work in sport, because the sport really varies in terms of the activation. For example, what we've noticed is that uh, in the activity like skiing, it works a lot, while there are other situations in which it doesn't work so much. My suggestion in the future would be also to work even uh, more closely with the orthopedic group for which we created now this available ortho forum that is uh, bringing together orthopedics because uh, as we know, there is very not so much uh, collaboration in this aspect. And in the last part of the talk, but we are like running short uh, in time, so I will um, rush up a little bit just for a general brainstorming with you in five minutes so we can um, accommodate some other questions. I really like once again to deeply thank all the huge professionals that have been part of this document that has 46 uh, affiliations uh, from all around the world. It is published on Phlebology Journal, and it is open access, and it is dedicated to the guidelines because before, I actually, I failed you because I gave you recommendations that are the European recommendations, but uh, guidelines are like uh, stars because uh, it's uh, like following, uh, like when we are navigating a light that we don't know if uh, is uh, still existing or if it is a dead star that simply is projecting still is light. It has been demonstrated uh, that one recommendation out of five becomes outdated every three years. So it's our duty not only to remain updated and probably in the future we will have to do like more like uh, online rather than uh, publishing with the editorial parts uh, period. We will have to combine the both and we will have to talk more together in such a globalized world because it is not possible to live in a world like the one I'm going to show you from a scientific standpoint. Before doing the meeting, uh, we look at the literature in uh, different uh, topics, 11. Two of them were dedicated to bandaging, as you can see, adjustable compression wraps, intermittent pneumatic compression, and graduated elastic stocking. So we are talking about um, compression. 
always we try to involve the new generation. So uh, they were presenting the data that were previously prepared with the masters. And we included also guidelines like the ones of Latin America that are surely worthy to be uh, uh, known and that uh, we didn't know so much before. So I'm really happy to suggest you to have a deep look at the document where you can see also the Latin American guidelines. I have to really rush up because uh, we, we took quite a lot of time on the questions and I'm happy for that. But just some uh, comments. Let me just take you to the important ones and you can dive into that um, in the document. We all agree basically that compression in answer recurrence uh, is fundamental. You can see over here this graph that is showing you Europe, Latin America, for example. Uh, we all agree in this moment that adjustable compression reps are safe and are demonstrating uh, um, a significant uh, efficacy both in uh, lymphedema and in answer management. We are totally lacking, in my opinion, homogeneous protocol in intermittent pneumatic compression. Based on where you are, in terms of geography and in terms of guidelines, you are going to have different recommendations. In. And um, at the same time, it is important we stress out, and in the document you have uh, the most le recent literature and also topics for future research, the importance of using compression properly when you're doing an investigation. I told you before, only 19% of people in this investigation on trauma patients with IPC, with intermittent pneumatic compression, were receiving proper protocols. So these data tell us that we get the risk of reading not valuable papers. On the other side, if we focus on stockings, um, again, we are uh, basically agreeing internationally on their impact on venous symptoms. We are not agreeing so much on the venous uh, thrombosis part, even in the same uh, continent sometimes, as you can see in the, this example over here. So this is a topic that we should really dive into. This is uh, indeed to go back to the questions of the, um, the valuable colleague before about postoperative compression. Look how it goes in terms of recommendation if we move uh, from uh, Europe 2015-18 uh, and uh, the Americans guidelines. And the same thing if you talk about how long this compression should last in uh, the post-procedural phase. We have the guidelines that are saying 24 hours and all the way up to three weeks according to other guidelines. Same thing for the pressure from 16 on, in some guidelines all the way to 40 millimeter mercury. Uh, I will conclude with a hope that is the one of uh, flying soon uh, so that we can uh, be on together also in person. We still have to define what is a long distance of flight. So when we are talking about the different guidelines, if we don't specify exactly the hours, we, may, we mean we get the risk of comparing oranges and apples. You will look in the document all the future lines of research that uh, we need. I will conclude with uh, our last study that I was mentioning that is pretty peculiar because it's always the same uh, subject that you may be recognized in this picture that was flying uh, quite a lot was using uh, 15, 20 minutes of mercury. It was standardizing uh, always four hours, putting the stockings always in the same takeoff moment and, in, uh, um, and after four hours, going uh, away from his own country um, um, without stockings, but with normal socks, and going back uh, with uh, um, 15, 20 minutes of mercury stockings. Now, the data that this was able to control uh, the edema is pretty obvious according to the literature we had before. But the interesting part was uh, dividing the leg in different segments, so to assess the different uh, variations of volume inside the leg. And as you can see in reality, this is the example with the socks, not with the graduated compression stockings. You have quite a tourniquet effect that is pretty evident, uh, as we know, on uh, your ankle. And uh, you have variations that are not really totally graduated or progressive. Same thing when uh, you are using graduated compression stocking. Now we could talk a lot about this data, but the take home message is that we really have to dive more into the science of compression because that it is. And if we will make this effort, I'm sure we will improve significantly the care of our patients because we know empirically uh, that uh, it was true what uh, um, Lon Vanderbilt was uh, saying in the medieval time that it was a divine uh, uh, way of uh, treating uh, our patients. I'd like to conclude inviting you to reach out to your patients uh, with uh, education. Um, with the Women Foundation, we have a free education of questionnaires that are like a revision of the literature in different languages, so they can enjoy those ones. And uh, I truly hope that uh, you will be with us in uh, fighting fake news. This uh, paper 
showed that 40% of medical uh, websites are including fake news that are usually shared 450,000 times, for which we um, are waiting all of you in uh, the V Winter 2021 initiative that will be dedicated to the creation of a consensus document that is already ongoing and thank all uh, the societies, including uh, the Egyptian ones that are involved. There is a form uh, where everybody can report in uh, whatever language, even anonymously, eventually uh, encountered fake news in the news and in fact. These are tough days for COVID outbreak. So with the Bewin Foundation, we created educational videos for the patients. They are available for free in different languages and I thank all the colleagues who took part in that as I thank the ones who will take part in the, what we call the Food for Veins, Veins for Food, uh, Lancet recently came out uh, showing that the, the real problem with COVID will be starvation because of course people who are living on the street, living with a few uh, uh, sources of income. So starvation will be a big thing. So Food for Veins, meaning that we will provide for free education, but we like to ask the ones who will attend these courses to donate, uh, not to the Bewin Foundation, but to whatever organization that is uh, dedicated to pro food projects, uh, part of their incomes in terms of uh, paying tracks. With this, I conclude and I thank you all for your attention and I hope uh, we will see each other very soon before Dubai and also in Dubai. Thank you. Uh, it's great. Thank you very much, Sergio. It was splendid as usual. Thank we you. have a very huge number of questions but unfortunately, we don't have enough time to answer. So I thank you very much. And I thank the panel very much for contribution and fame uh, attendees. And uh, I leave the mic for uh, Dr. Omar Farouk to introduce Professor Ahmad al Sattar for the next presentation. Thank you all. So I will stop my share, right? Yes. Yes. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let, me, let me introduce one of the most eminent uh, consultant doctor surgeon in Egypt, Professor Ahmed Abdul Sattar from Mataria Hospital. Um, he is going to speak about uh, acute lower limb ischemia and its management in Egypt. And uh, hopefully, we'll open uh, a lot of time to discussion because I like all the panelists to tell us the impact that they have with COVID-19 on their vascular practice, uh, each one of them. So uh, if you like to start uh, screen sharing, Professor Ahmed Abdul Sattar. Uh, uh, I'm just a moment and uh, thank you, Dr. Omar. I just uh, change my, uh, my